We're going live uh, to the House of Commons uh, for uh, Prime Minister's questions. Uh, Prime Minister, a lot on his agenda today. And after Prime Minister's questions, there will be a minute's silence, followed by half an hour of tributes to uh, James Brokenshire, the former Northern Ireland Secretary who died of cancer uh, recently. Just uh, seeing now um, Alok Sharma, uh, the uh, climate change envoy to the COP meeting in two weeks' time. Uh, finishing up uh, answering questions. Uh, and uh, Beth Ruby, I mean, it has to be said, the government's announcements on reaching net zero yesterday got a pretty mixed reception. Yeah, there's a pathway to get it, but the question about how it's uh, funded and the reliability of the technology and how much that will cost and how much it will cost the taxpayer are obviously very live questions, but it runs to 2050. So there's a roadmap, if you like, but the detail about how it actually happens and the cost to the taxpayer are still huge questions, with obviously the Chancellor and the Treasury uh, also releasing a document which quite explicitly said that you might have to... Well, let's see if this comes up. Prime Minister's questions getting underway. So Lindsay Hoyle, uh, the Speaker, setting the ball rolling. ...is available to watch on Parliament Live TV. We now start with questions, Prime Minister. Rachel Muskell. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Number one, please. Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Rachel Buskell. David Amos and James Brokenshire were both tragically taken from us. Both served this place with integrity and served their constituents well. And as we offer our heartfelt love and prayers to their families, their families have offered us a new path to a new politics built on kindness and love. Mr Speaker, Sarah Everard and Claudia Lawrence were both from York. And right now, women are feeling unsafe. Many women are unsafe. And the very people that should be protecting us are telling us to engage with potential perpetrators to identify them, to flag down a bus, or to know the laws of arrest better. Confidence in the police has taken its toll. But as women, we are confident and determined to change this. So every girl and every woman can live at home without fear, can go to school or work without harassment, can go online without objectification, and can walk our streets safely again. What steps will the Prime Minister take to ensure women with lived experience can lead on this work, and by when? Prime Minister. I, I thank her very much for her question, and she raises a most important issue, Mr Speaker, one of the most important that this country faces. And I want all people in this country, particularly women, uh, to feel confident in our police force. And I believe that they can and uh, that they should. And what we're doing now to make sure that women in particular feel safe at night is we're investing in uh, safer streets, in better street lighting, in more CCT CCTV. But what we also have to do, Mr Speaker, as I think the whole House understands, is ensure we deal with the systemic problems in the criminal justice system uh, to ensure that, bit, that men, and I'm afraid it is almost always men, get prosecuted for rape and for crimes of serious sexual and domestic violence uh, in the way that they should, and that we secure the convictions that we should, Mr Speaker, and that when we secure the, those convictions, those individuals get the tough sentencing that they deserve, Mr Speaker, and that's what this side of the House <coughs> believes in. Local. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Having a prematurely born child in neonatal intensive care means that for families, every day can be a struggle, practically, financially and emotionally. Trying to continue with life as normal whilst racked with worry and a guilt that simply never leaves you is just not possible. That's why the Prime Minister's commitment to deliver neonatal or even pay for parents in this situation is so important. It's for the Prime Minister to meet with me to discuss how quickly we can put this through Parliament so parents are getting this support as quickly as possible. Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I will make sure that my right honourable friend, my honourable friend has uh, the relevant meeting as fast as we can, uh, can organise it. And I know that many parents, uh, particularly those who have premature and sick babies, feel that the current system isn't working well for them. And that's why I can uh, tell my honourable friend we will legislate to allow parents of children in neonatal care to take extended leave. Details of this policy were published last year and we will bring forward the legislation as soon as possible. We now come to the Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer. Yeah. Yeah. 
Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I pay tribute to Ernie Ross, a formidable campaigner who served this place and his constituents with great distinction for three decades? And Mr Speaker, I will pay my respects and tribute to James Brokenshire immediately after this Prime Minister's questions. Can I thank the whole House for the way the tributes to Sir David were handled on Monday? We saw the best of this House, and I want to see if we can use that collaborative spirit to make progress on one of the issues that was raised on Monday, tackling violent extremism. It's three years since the Government promised an online safety bill, but it's not yet before the House. Meanwhile, the damage caused by harmful content online is worse than ever. Dangerous algorithms on Facebook and Instagram and Hope Not Hate have shown me an example of violent Islamism and far-right propaganda on TikTok. What I was shown has been reported to the moderators, but it stayed online because apparently it didn't contravene the guidelines. I have to say I find that hard to believe. So will the Prime Minister build on the desire shown by this House on Monday to get things done and commit to bring forward the second reading of the online safety bill by the end of this calendar year? If he does, we'll support it. Yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I thank the right honourable gentleman for the spirit in which he has approached this issue, and I echo what he says about the need for cooperation across the House, because the safety of, of MPs, indeed of all uh, public servants, everybody who engages uh, with the public is of vital importance, and uh, the online safety bill is of, of huge importance to, uh, it's one of the most important tools in our armoury. And what we're doing is ensuring that we crack down on uh, companies that promote illegal and, uh, and dangerous content, and we'll be uh, toughening up uh, those provisions. But, Mr Speaker, what we are also going to do is ensure that uh, the online safety bill does complete uh, its, uh, its stages uh, before this House, uh, before, uh, before Christmas. And I'm delighted, uh, or rather, that we do bring, forward, uh, the, uh, bring it forward before Christmas in the way, that he, uh, the way that he suggests. And I'm delighted, Mr Speaker, that he is uh, offering his support. And, uh, and we, we look forward to that. Keir Starmer. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Prime Minister. I, I think from that, um, and this isn't a challenge, it's to clarify, that the pre-legislative scrutiny will be finished um, before, in early December, uh, and that the second reading could, uh, I think, be before uh, the end of this calendar year. Um, but we do need to get on with this. Telegram has been described as the app of choice for extremists. Uh, and, Mr Speaker, if you can believe it, if the House can believe it, as we were paying tribute to Sir David on Monday, Telegram users could access videos of murders and violent threats against politicians, the LGBT community, women and Jews, as we were paying our respects. Some of these posts are illegal. All of them are harmful. And Hope Not Hate and the Board of Deputies have said that Telegram has, in their words, facilitated and nurtured a subculture that cheerleads for terrorists. Tough sanctions are clearly needed. Yet, under the government's current proposals, directors of platforms failing to crack down on extremism would still not face criminal sanctions. Why is that? Yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, the, this, this, it is this government that brought forward an online uh, harms bill. Mr Speaker, and he's heard, uh, it's, he's heard what I've said. He's heard what I've said about, uh, about the second reading before Christmas. And, uh, you know, in the, in the collegiate spirit in which uh, he, he, he announced his, uh, he began his questioning, I can tell him that we will uh, continue to uh, look at ways in which we can toughen up those provisions and to come down hard on those who irresponsibly allow uh, dangerous and extremist content uh, to permeate the internet. But, Mr Speaker, uh, I, I'm, I'm, and I'm delighted that uh, he's taking this, this new uh, tough line, and I very much hope uh, that, he can, that he will get uh, the rest of his party in the lobbies with us to join him. Keir Starmer. Mr Speaker, I did start in a collegiate spirit. And I'll continue in a collegiate spirit because I listened hard to what was being said on the opposite benches on Monday about the concerns about this issue. Um, uh, and we do need uh, to recognise the measures in the bill, but we do need tough and effective sanctions, and that means criminal sanctions. And that does matter, Mr Speaker. 
It, it, it is frankly beyond belief that, as the Mirror reported yesterday, 40 hours of hateful content from Anjum Chowdhury could be easily accessed online. The Prime Minister and the Government could stop this by making it clear that directors of companies are criminally liable for failing to tackle this type of material on their sites. We don't need to delay, so in the collaborative spirit we saw in this House on Monday, will the Prime Minister commit to taking this away, looking at it again and working with all of us to strengthen his proposed legislation? I've already said that we're willing to uh, look at anything to strengthen the legislation. I've said that we're willing to uh, bring it forward, uh, and we will bring it forward to second reading before Christmas. And yes, of course, Mr Speaker, uh, we will have criminal sanctions uh, with tough sentences uh, for those who are responsible for allowing this foul content to, to permeate the internet, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, but what we hope for also is that no matter how tough the proposals we produce, that the, honour, that the opposition uh, will support it. Pierre Starmer. Uh, Mr Speaker, we're making progress. We've got the second reading committed to before Christmas. That is a good thing. And I think the Prime Minister is now committed to criminal sanctions. At the moment, they're a fallback position um, at the discretion of the Minister. Um, they should be, in my view, on the face of the bill as the automatic default for the failure to act. Now, if we're making progress on that, then we're beginning to address some of the issues that were uh, identified across the House on Monday. Can I turn to the... Um, report the Commission for Countering Extremism, which was set up in the wake of the horrific Manchester bombings. Eight months ago, that Commission made recommendations to plug gaps in existing legislation and strategy, gaps that extremists have been able to exploit and are continuing to exploit. Yet Sir Mark Rowley, formerly head of our counter-terrorism policing, who led on those recommendations, said just this week, I've had no feedback from the Home Office on their plans in relation to our report on the absence of a coherent legal framework to tackle hateful extremism. Given the seriousness of the matter and the clear need for action, why has the Government not responded to this important work? And will the Prime Minister now commit to act swiftly on the Commission's recommendations? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, the Government, and my right honourable friend, the Home Secretary, works with all parties to tackle violent extremism, and the UK has one of the strongest uh, counter-terrorism and counter-extremism uh, systems in the world, as a consequence of which we have foiled 31 terrorist plots uh, since 2017. And I pay tribute to the work of, of Sir Mark Rowley, with whom I worked extremely closely while I was in London, and, uh, and all those who are involved in foiling those terrorist plots. And I can uh, tell you, Mr Speaker, that they will receive the complete support of this House and, uh, and, and, and of this, uh, this Government, uh, nor will we allow them to be released, or those who are convicted, to be released early from prison, Mr Speaker, because that was one of the most important things this Government passed and which that party opposed. Yeah. Pierce Starmer. Uh, really? Uh, uh, after, after the week we've just had, I, 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 re I, I really don't want to descend to that kind of knockabout. Yeah. Mr Speaker, e either, we take this, either we take this seriously, and I'm taking my lead from those on the opposite benches on Monday and what they were saying about the need to tackle this. Either we take it seriously and go forward together, or we do a disservice to those that we pay tributes to. There are clearly, prob there are clearly problems with the government's counter-extremism strategy. Internet users are increasingly likely to come across extremist content online. The government's own independent reviewer has said that there is no evidence that the government's key de-radicalisation programme is effective. That's the government's independent reviewer saying that. And we've seen a spate of lone attack killings with the perpetrator invariably radicalised online. We all want to stop this across this House, but at the moment things are getting worse, not better. So what urgent plans does the Prime Minister have to fix these glaring problems. Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. Well, well Mr Speaker, I'm, I'm, all, I'm all in favour of uh, collegiate and cooperative 
uh, approach, and, 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 and then, uh, in, in which case, I think it would be a fine thing if the uh, opposition would withdraw their opposition to uh, our measures to stop the early release of, of serious extremist and violent offenders. Because that's all. That's all I'm trying to say. In a, in a, in a, in a, in a collegiate approach, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure that that is what the people of this country uh, would wish to see. Uh, but we will continue to do everything that we can uh, to strengthen our counterterrorism oper- operation and to support all those uh, who are involved in keeping us safe. And uh, obviously it is too early to draw any particular conclusions from the appalling killing of our, of our colleague, uh, but we will draw all relevant conclusions from that investigation. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Mr Speaker. The inescapable desire of this House on Monday to finally clamp down on the extremism, the hate and the abuse that festers online is incredibly welcome. But closing down anonymous accounts would not have prevented the murder of Joe Cox, nor of PC Keith Palmer. And although we don't know the full circumstances surrounding his death, nor would it have saved Sir David. If we're to get serious about stopping violent attacks, we need to stop online spaces being safe spaces for terrorists. We need to ensure that unaccountable, arrogant social media companies take responsibility for their platforms. We need to end the delays, get on with the legislation and clean out the cesspit once and for all. Mr Speaker, I've prosecuted terrorists and I've prosecuted extremists. I've worked with Sir Mark and others. Dozens of Labour MPs have worked hard on tackling social media companies on these issues. I started collegiately and I'll continue collegiately. We know what it takes. We can help. So will the Prime Minister now capture the spirit that we've seen this week and agree to work with us on a cross-party basis so that we can tackle violent extremism and its enablers together? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to, uh, to join the uh, right honourable gentleman in uh, committing to tackle, tackling online harms uh, together, to tackling violent extremism together, and that, that is what uh, the government I- is doing. And that's why we brought forward the online harms bill. Uh, that's why we're investing uh, record sums in tackling counter-terrorism. Uh, but, Mr Speaker, I-, I must say that what I think the whole country and the whole House would certainly want to see, in addition, in addition, if I can say this to the, to the right honourable gentleman in a, in, a, in a collegiate spirit, in addition is a commitment uh, by the Labour Party in future to support measures and not to allow the early release of those terrorists and those who are convicted of those offences from prison. And I, if, if you could hear that from the Labour Party, I think it would be a fine thing. Crispin Blunt. Um, Mr Speaker, knowing my right honourable friend's commitment to UK bioscience, and his understanding of the exciting potential for improving mental health treatments for conditions such as depression, trauma and addiction, will he cut through the current barriers to research into psilocybin and similar compounds so the British public receive and British science research and British pharmaceutical companies enable the potential treatments into these most debilitating conditions to be delivered at the earliest possible opportunity? Prime Minister. Uh, I thank my honourable friend I know who has a very active interest in this, in this area. What I can say to him is that we will consider the Advisory Council on the Misuse of Drugs' uh, recent advice on, on reducing barriers to research uh, with uh, controlled drugs such as the one he uh, describes, and we'll be getting back to him as soon as possible. We now come to the leader of the SNP, Ian Blackford. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and can I join with the leader of the opposition? in sending condolences to the family of Ernie Ross. <clears throat> Mr Speaker, in 11 short days, world leaders will gather in Glasgow for COP26. This is our best chance, and very likely our last chance, to confront the climate emergency faced by our planet. That is why it was such a devastating blow that on the eve of COP26, this UK government rejected the Scottish Clusters bid to gain track one status for carbon capture storage. Today's Press and Journal have said there is no valid reason and no acceptable excuse for this decision and have called for a U-turn on this colossal mistake immediately. We know this decision wasn't made on technical or logical grounds. This devastating decision was purely political. Scotland's North East was promised this investment in 2014. It is a promise 
that has been broken time and time again. So, Mr Speaker, will the Prime Minister finally live up to those promises, or are they simply not worth the Tory election leaflets that they are written on? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, we remain absolutely committed to uh, helping uh, industrial clusters to decarbonise across uh, the whole of the country, and of course, including Scotland. And uh, I, I know that the, the I know that there was disappointment about the Acorn uh, bid in in Aberdeen, and that's why it has been selected as a reserve cluster, Mr. Speaker. But there could be no more vivid testimony to this government's commitment uh, to Scotland, uh, or, or indeed to fighting climate change, that the whole world is about to come uh, to Scotland, uh, Mr. Speaker, to look at what Scotland is doing to help tackle climate change. And I congratulate the people of Scotland on their efforts. Ian Blackford. Mr Speaker, people across Scotland are looking for answers today and they're getting none. Yeah. All they see is yet another Tory broken promise. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. bad enough that this UK government is holding back Captain Carter in Scotland. But across the board, they are proving an active barrier to renewable energy opportunities. Yeah. Tidal stream energy has the potential to generate 20% of UK generation capacity, exactly the same, Prime Minister, as nuclear. Yeah. All this industry needs is a ring fence budget yeah. of £71 million, oh. a drop in the ocean yeah. compared to the £23 billion yeah. that this government is throwing at the nuclear plant yeah. in yeah. But the UK government are failing to give this support, threatening shovel-ready projects like Maygen in the north of Scotland. Yep. So at the very least today, Prime Minister, stand up and guarantee a ring fence budget for tidal stream energy and save this renewable industry from being lost overseas. Yeah. Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, actually, I, you know, I, I congratulate uh, the right honourable gentleman on raising uh, tidal energy. He's absolutely right. I've seen the, the, the amazing uh, projects that are, that are underway, and we're certainly we're, we're looking at, uh, at finance. We're putting huge sums, I think the House uh, will acknowledge, into clean, green energy generation. And he's far too gloomy, uh, Mr Speaker, about the prospects of, of Acorn in, uh, in, in Aberdeen. I think he needs to be a seeds with an unaccustomed spirit spirit uh, of optimism, uh, because, because actually uh, the, acorn, the, acorn, the ACORN project still has strong potential, and that's why it's been selected as a reserve cluster, and he should keep hope alive, Mr Speaker, rather than uh, spreading gloom in the way that he does. Thank you, Mr Speaker. It's always a pleasure to follow the Honourable Gentleman and the new quiet man of British politics. Long may it continue. <laughs> Two week the, weekend before, the weekend before last, I went to sea with the Brixham trawlers, and Brixham Fish Market is now turning over £1.4 million a week. They're looking forward to their share of the levelling up fund, but they're also looking forward to the previously announced £100 million fisheries and seafood scheme. When will we be seeing that Pillar 2 and 3 launch, and will the Prime Minister reaffirm his commitment to our coastal communities and our fishing sector? Yeah. I thank my honourable friend for what he's doing for, the, uh, for, for fishing and, for, and for, for the coastal communities and for Brixham in particular. I understand the fish market in uh, Brixham was outstandingly successful. Uh, the other day, and what we're going to do is make sure that we continue to support uh, fishing and the seafood business across the, the country, and uh, the scheme has approved funding in Brixham, in Salcombe and in Dartmouth, uh, Mr Speaker, and a further £100 million pounds is being made available uh, through the UK Seafood Fund to support our fisheries. Liz Savile Roberts. Uh -huh. If COP26 is to be successful, People must be at the heart of our net zero emission. For too long, the UK economy has left too many people behind, with wealth and investment hoarded in the southeast of England. Devolving powers over the Crown Estate would bring half a billion pounds worth of offshore wind and tidal stream potential under Welsh control. Assets, of course, currently controlled by Westminster. Scotland, meanwhile, already has these powers. Will he support my bill 
to devolve the management of the Crown Estate to Wales. Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, well, uh, Mr Speaker, as, as she already knows, the Crown Estate works closely with the Welsh Government and with natural resources in Wales. And I, I'm, I'm sorry to have to tell her that uh, my view is that the Crown Estate in Wales, uh, d- the devolution of the Crown Estate in Wales would fragment the market, uh, complicate uh, existing processes and make it more difficult uh, for Wales as well as the, the whole of the UK uh, to move forward to, to net zero. Brendan Clarksmith. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Delivering new homes is key to levelling up, uh, as is putting that power in the hands of local people and making sure we build the right number in the right places. But my constituents, especially in Thievesdale and Audsall, are concerned about over-intensive developments in our local plan. Will the Prime Minister confirm that the minimum housing requirement for Bassett Law is 4,896 ah. and not the 10,000 as claimed by the Labour on Council? Ah. Well, Mr Speaker, I'm not surprised to say that my honourable friend is completely right. And, uh, he, and this government is, uh, is determined to give the people of this country the the homes that they need. We're building record numbers of homes, but we owe it uh, to, uh, to our, our kinder, gentler politics, Mr Speaker, to, uh, to be accurate about what is going on in our constituencies. And this government does not set local housing uh, targets. And I understand that the draft Bassett Law local plan is subject uh, to consultation. I would encourage him and his constituents to make their views known. Mr Speaker, tomorrow at 2.50pm, my constituency will fall silent as we mark exactly 50 years since Scotland's largest peacetime explosion ripped through Clarkston Toll in East Renfrewshire. Ten shops were demolished by the ignition of gas which had escaped from a fractured gas main beneath the shops. A passing bus was caught up in the blast. 22 people died, mostly women, and over 100 were injured. Tomorrow, 50 years on, the community and families will come together for a memorial service. So will the Prime Minister join me in acknowledging the terrible losses that many families locally suffered (coughs) and the continuing sorrow in the community and in reflecting that the victims of the Clarkston disaster must never be forgotten? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I thank the Honourable Lady for, for raising this uh, anniversary, and uh, she is right to commemorate the victims of the Clarkson disaster. And uh, our thoughts and our condolences continue to be with uh, the families of those who, who lost uh, lost loved ones. And of course, we must do everything in our power to make sure that no such uh, tragedy is repeated. Robinson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The failings of Greater Manchester Police, which have led to it being placed in special measures, are well documented, including the failure to record 80,000 crimes in a single year and those included domestic violence and sexual offences. But it's particularly important that the force addresses what what a recent Manchester Evening News investigation called its culture of denial and secrecy. After the horrific murder of Sarah Everard, it's crucial that we tackle the cover-up culture. Will my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, therefore, join me in calling for Greater Manchester Police to urgently review its internal culture And also, will he consider reforming the law on whistleblowing so people in Greater Manchester Police and other organisations can speak up against wrongdoing in confidence? Prime Minister. Yes, yes, Mr Speaker, it's vital that people should uh, have the confidence to speak up against wrongdoing wherever they find it, particularly, of of course, in the the police. I I do believe that the people of uh, Greater Manchester deserve better. I, I, I support and agree with what... Uh, my honourable friend says. I would just say one thing, Mr Speaker. It it is the responsibility of the Mayor of Greater Manchester uh, to ensure that the the, the police force acts, uh, not a a, a point that I hope will be taken up on the benches opposite, uh, to ensure that the the police force acts swiftly and decisively to address the failures that his constituents are currently finding. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I would like to join colleagues in paying tribute to the Honourable Member for Southendown C. He was a good friend and an esteemed parliamentarian. I also wish to pay tribute to the right Honourable Member for Old Baxley and Sidco. He served this House and country absolutely and will be missed by members across the House. Mr. Speaker, heating bills, food shops, and fuel costs are all rising at a staggering speed. This winter, millions of families on universal credit 
will be forced to choose between eating or heating. Given the crisis in living costs we are now facing, will the Prime Minister reconsider his scrapping of the universal credit uplift and reinstate the £20 a week lifeline he has just taken away? Mr Speaker, what we're doing is ensuring that uh, we keep costs of heating down with the, the, the price cap. We put the, we put the, uh, we put, we've increased the winter, uh, the, the, warm heat, the warm homes allowance uh, by £150,000 uh, £150 for 780,000 uh, homes. And we've just given local councils another half billion uh, to help uh, poorer families uh, over, uh, over the winter. But the most important thing that's happening, Mr Speaker, in this country is that wages are going up. And uh, there, is a, there is a huge jobs boom now in this country, thanks to the policies that this government has pursued. Bob Blackman. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm sure my right honourable friend would agree with me that homeless people should be assisted and not arrested. The review of the repeal of the Vacancy Act 1824 has now been concluded. Does my right honourable friend agree with me, therefore, that it is now time that the amendments to the Police, Crime, Sentencing and Courts Bill, which are being considered in the other place, should be adopted so that we can consign the Vacancy Act to the history books forever, but give the police the powers they need to combat trespass, aggressive begging and other antisocial behaviour. Yes. Uh, Mr Speaker, my, my honourable friend is a passionate campaigner on this issue and he, 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 he's done a lot of, uh, of good things in this area. No one should be criminalised simply for having nowhere to live and I think the time has come to reconsider the Vagrancy Act, Mr Speaker, but also to redouble our efforts uh, to fight homelessness as I think we've done successfully over the pandemic but must continue to do. Lynn Fletcher. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mr Speaker. University Hospitals, Coventry and Warwickshire NHS Trust, has dealt with more than 600 attacks on staff during the pandemic. To deter further attacks, staff in the hospital's A&E department are now wearing body cameras. It simply isn't right that doctors and nurses should have to go to such lengths just to feel safe at work. Will the Prime Minister join me in condemning those abhorrent attacks and say what immediate steps he will take to better protect our NHS heroes as they go about their work treating patients and saving lives? Yeah. Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I, I join the Honourable Lady Opposite uh, absolutely in condemning attacks on, uh, on all public uh, servants and particularly on NHS staff who are, who are trying to, to save people and, 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 and help people in, in their lives. And uh, what, we are, all, what we are doing, what we've already done, is to toughen the sentences uh, for those who assault or, for, or, who, or who harass public servants. We now come to Charlize Val, final question. Given the recent tragic circumstances, there has inevitably been a focus on the security of members and their staff. Mr Speaker, one aspect that is often overlooked is the fact that it is our staff who are on the front line in receiving the abusive emails and correspondence, and they take the hostile phone calls. They are private citizens, simply trying to earn a living to put food on the table and pay for their rent or their mortgage. Yet they are caught up in this vicious cycle of venom and abuse that is directed towards us. Would my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, take this opportunity to acknowledge the fantastic work that our staff do and give them the credit that they so rightly deserve? Yeah, yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I think that uh, my right honourable friend spoke there for the entire House of Commons, because uh, we all know that uh, it is our staff, our, our case workers, our office managers uh, who are so often uh, in the front line, who have to deal uh, with anger, uh, with intemperate uh, behaviour uh, and with abuse, and they cope with it uh, magnificently. We all know that the, risks, the risks that they run in their daily lives, and indeed, Mr Speaker, we've seen how some House of Commons staff have paid uh, for, that, for, that, for their sacrifice, in, even with their lives. And, Mr Speaker, I thoroughly echo and support and concur with what uh, my honourable friend has said. Order. 
I said on Monday that the House would have an opportunity to pay tribute and remember our friend and colleague James Brokenshire. I would like to do so by inviting members to join me in a minute's silence in memory of James. Can we all please stand? Thank you. James was a politician who commanded affection and respect from colleagues, no matter which party they represented, in a parliamentary career spanning 16 years. James's contribution to public life was immense. He served in successive governments, in ministerial roles across the Home Office, as well as serving as Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, and later as Secretary of State for Housing, Communities and Local Government. His commitment to serving his constituents in Old Bexley and Sidcup was also obvious to anybody who knew him. I will always remember James for his positivity, his good sense of humour and for being one of the most friendly, thoughtful, well-liked in the House of Commons. His passing is profound loss to us all. Our thoughts go out to his wife, Cathy, and the three children who are here today to watch our tributes. So I just want to remind people, the family are with us, and it is great that they've turned up today, and thank you. Yeah. Order, we now come to the point where we start with the Prime Minister to start the tributes. Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I, I'm sure the whole House will join me in, uh, and, and you in expressing our deep sorrow over the tragically early death of James Brokenshire, and in sending our heartfelt, heartfelt condolences to his wife, Cathy, uh, and their three children, Sophie, Gemma and Ben, uh, who are with us today for the loss of a beloved husband and father. The many tributes paid to James, a testament to the affection, respect and esteem in which he is remembered, and his skill as an able and effective politician, who served his country under three Prime Ministers in some of the most sensitive and demanding positions in government. I worked closely with James for the first time when I was Mayor of London, and he was the Honourable Member for Hornchurch, and then for Old Bexley and Sidcup. And I saw how much he cared for the interests of his constituents, always taking the time to stop and talk to people and listen to what they had to say, unflappable, earnest, sincere, and he brought those same down-to-earth qualities into other areas of his life. Being photographed baking cakes in his kitchen, <laughs> starting a Twitter frenzy on the vital question of whether he owned two ovens or four. <laughs> and once when challenged by an interviewer to choose between South End or the South of France, his reply was swift, South End, I'm an Essex boy and proud of my roots. And he would be delighted to know that his birthplace has now achieved city status uh, in tribute to his friend, Sir David Amos, whose campaign he supported. But it was James's diligence, composure and experience as a lawyer, steeped in the art of negotiating last-minute deals, that proved so valuable to the government. He held five ministerial jobs, including two in Cabinet as Secretary of State for Northern Ireland and for housing, communities and local government. And every one of them 
was fraught with traps for the unwary and opportunities for error. The fact that he improved his reputation in each post shows that we've lost an astute politician of rare ability. James served with particular distinction in the Home Office as Security and Immigration Minister, where he was fondly known by civil servants as JB. Oh good, they would say, we've got JB on this one. And he often reflected that working at the Home Office was to be on the receiving end of incessant incoming fire from the media. And it usually fell to him to brave the barrage when things got really sticky. So it's no wonder that uh, on his last day, officials presented James with an authentic military-grade tin hat. <laughs> During that tumultuous period, which I remember well, uh, he, helped, he helped to keep our country safe. He oversaw the superb security operation that protected the London Olympic and Paralympic Games in 2012. He was central to getting rid of Abu Qatada, setting him packing after more than a decade of legal wrangles, and he steered the groundbreaking modern slavery bill through Parliament, giving the police and law enforcement agencies the power they need to combat some of the most dangerous and repellent criminals of all. And through all this, he would help individuals in need, including taking the time to meet people with direct experience of government decisions. And it was after a conversation with a homeless man in Bristol that he acted to strengthen the rights of tenants and give them a greater sense of security in their homes. We can only imagine how much more good he would have done if he had been given the chance. James was in the prime of his life, with a huge amount still to offer his country. And it was the cruelest of fates that he, a non-smoker, should have been struck down by lung cancer. His tenacious fight showed the depths of his, his courage and his character. After his first bout with the disease, as colleagues will remember, he was back in this house within weeks serving in government and helping his constituents. He campaigned for better lung cancer screening, becoming the first honourable member to secure a debate on this issue in the House. He sought to dispel the stigma and misperceptions around the disease. And when James fell sick again earlier this year, even in the midst of his ordeal, he summoned the strength to record a video message encouraging others to seek help and early treatment. Every member of this House willed him then to pull through, but sadly it was not to be. James was a gentleman politician, and I hope my right honourable friend, the member for Maidenhead, will allow me to quote her words, that politics and Parliament would be the better if there were more people of his calibre involved and politics and Parliament are the weaker for his loss. I could not agree more. James's absence will be sorely felt in this House, in the great departments where he served, and by all the people whose lives he touched. Yeah. We've come to the Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. One of the first things I learned when I arrived in this House was that there are not many glamorous roles in opposition. No one gives you a guidebook on how to do these jobs. You're appointed and off you go. Of course, you can ask older, wiser heads. You can appoint excellent staff, but generally, you're on your own. There's one little known exception to this rule, a secret in Westminster, and that is when you shadow a government minister of such decency, courtesy and sense of fair play that they reach out across the divide and provide helpful pointers, you're not on your own. And so it was for me. When, as a new MP in 2015, I was appointed as shadow immigration minister, I shadowed James Brokenshire. 
I have to admit I was unprepared for the vagaries of the Bill Committee rules. Even years in the criminal justice system had not prepared me for the complexities of the archive uh, processes. But in one of my first outings in the Bill Committee, I almost missed my cue to make my argument. Now, some of you would see that as a blessing. <laughs> but James was far too decent for that. He wouldn't take advantage. He went out of his way to ensure not only that I was heard, but that I was heard with respect. And that was the characteristic, that was the character that was James. And from that day in 2015, we forged a friendship which lasted until his untimely death. And on these benches, my story is not an unusual story, because anyone who got to know James, who worked with him or against him, ended up respecting him and liking him and willing him to pull through. At the time I got to know James, he was widely seen as an upcoming star of this house. As the Prime Minister has said, he'd already played a key role in the creation of the Modern Slavery Act, and he'd begun to carve out a reputation as an unassuming but very effective minister. He was a party leader's dream, happy to roll up his sleeves, do the tough jobs, with little regard for self-promotion. But advancing your career in any walk of life isn't just about hard work and talent, although James had those in abundance. It's about who you are. And it was little surprise when James got a full role in the Cabinet, first as Northern Ireland Secretary and then as Community Secretary. And he brought his calm and understated manner, his effectiveness and his respect for others to both roles, and he will be long remembered for it. <coughs> when someone is taken as young as James was by a cruel disease like cancer, there is an inevitable sense that they were robbed of fulfilling their potential. And James was. He had achieved so much, but I strongly believe, we all strongly believe, that he had so much more to give. Characteristically, right to the end, he was campaigning to remove the stigma from lung cancer in order to improve the lives of others, a cause I hope this House continues to champion in his memory. James's wife and young family are with us here today. We send our condolences, and if I may say so, they should be very proud of their husband and father. Amen. And they should know that across these, this house, on all of these benches, he commanded enormous respect and goodwill. Amongst his constituents, he was very well liked. He was a friend to many of us across this house, including me. Our politics is poorer without him. We will miss him but we will all ensure that his memory lives on. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Father of the House, Pete, St Peter Bottom. <laughs> on the 30th of April 2018, Mr Speaker said it must be enormous fun shave broken shower at mealtime. That was when James said he used to discuss local government with his father when his father was the chief executive in the borough I then served. James in that column 10, used seven words to describe his father as having a focus and a dedication as a public servant. James learnt that lesson. He also said that private leaseholders should not be, have the costs of fire remediation passed onto them. I think fulfilling his dedication as housing minister, I invite the Chancellor and the Prime Minister to discuss how that can be fulfilled, because at the moment those costs are being passed on to those leaseholders. We now come to the leader of the SNP in Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. <clears throat> I think we all share the real sense of sadness that in the space of two days we are meeting again to pay tribute to another <clears throat> deceased colleague. Two colleagues taken in very different circumstances, but both taken well before their time. Mr Speaker, James Brokenshire was a young man 
who clearly had so much more to give. That is what must be so tragic for his colleagues and friends on the government benches, and we are all very conscious and compassionate to the pain that they must be feeling this week. But most especially, we think of James's young family. On behalf of these benches, our thoughts and prayers are, are with his wife Catherine, his son Ben, and his daughters Sophie and Gemma. It is important to mark the manner in which that family have dealt with their grief, but I know that they have been deeply involved in remarkable fundraising efforts since James's untimely death. That spirit that the family have shown since his death is no doubt a tribute to the way in which James himself dealt with his illness. But I think all of us across this House looked on with deep admiration and awe at the sheer bravery he showed while bravely battling against the cancer that sadly ultimately took his life. My own experience and engagement with James was mainly when he was the Minister at the Home Office. When he was an Immigration Minister, I remember dealing with James in some detail on a particular case concerning a family in the Highlands who were being threatened with deportation. And I'm glad to say, Mr Speaker, that after some considerable effort from all involved, that the family eventually got the resolution that they desperately needed. I know from colleagues in Northern Ireland as well that although his time there came at a politically delicate and difficult period, he remained on very good terms with all the parties during his period as Secretary of State. I think it's fair to say that that in itself is no mean feat yeah, yeah. for any British Secretary of State that serves there. And I can only think that it was because of the way that he approached people and the way that he approached his work. Because it has been very rightly said that there wasn't a man interested in the insubstantial distractions of politics. He quietly got on with his job. He was, above all else, diligent and determined. The mark of a man and our memory of him will be of a dedicated minister, a loyal friend and a dedicated father. James battled to the very end against his cancer. Now that his battle is over, may he rest in peace. God bless you, James. Theresa May. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I had the enormous privilege of working with James Brokenshaw in government, first of all for six years in the Home Office, and then in his roles as Secretary of State for Northern Ireland and Communities Secretary. James was a remarkable man. He was an outstanding minister, a great constituency member of Parliament, and a true friend. <laughs> Words have been used by others, such as diligent, hardworking, and he was both of those. As a minister, he was assiduous in dealing with the briefs that he, was, uh, that he read. He was thoughtful in his consideration of the issues and careful in his decision-making. That is what you want from a government minister. He gave his time and effort because he understood the importance of the decisions he was making. He cared about people and he cared about the work he was doing. And that came through in all the decisions he made and in the way in which he reached out across this House to ensure that those decisions were the right ones. So he was an outstanding minister, but he was also a very good constituency MP. Very often, uh, if you try to contact a minister on a Friday, they're in their office. But actually, James, more often than not, was in his constituency. And that's what he understood. All of us are here because our constituents have placed us here. And anybody who is fortunate enough to become a government minister is only there because their constituents have placed them here. And we should never forget that is the basis of our being here and our responsibilities. He was a true friend. If, from what I've said and what others have said, you get the impression that James was just a hard-working workaholic, James was great fun. Uh, evenings with Cathy and James were evenings of fun and laughter. And he was also a loving family man. And I remember when uh, he had been diagnosed, first diagnosed with his lung cancer, and he was stepping down from government. 
his first thought to me was about the impact it would have on Cathy and the family. He was that loving family man. He was out there in his constituency, and he great gave dedicated public service to this country. Mm -hmm. The government is the poorer for his loss. Yeah, yeah. This parliament is the poorer for his loss. And our country is the poorer for his loss. Yeah. Yeah. Well, tribute to James, tribute, tribute to James Brokenshire there from uh, Theresa May, the Prime Minister, who worked with him uh, most closely. Uh, really reflecting a pretty sombre mood in Prime Minister's questions today, of course, following the killing of David Amos as well uh, last week. And a new approach taken to Prime Minister's questions, uh, what Sir Keir Starmer called the collegiate spirit. Uh, with me, our political editor, Beth Rigby. And uh, it was a, an effective session, but not what we've got used to. And at one point, uh, Sir Keir said, I really don't want to descend to this kind of knock knockabout. Yeah, it's interesting because remember on Monday when MPs talked about having more consensus across the House, uh, Rupert Hook ended that session saying we need to be less cross and more cross-party. That was how she, a Labour MP, kind of closed the session uh, in those tributes to Sir David Amos. And then um, um, Keir Starmer really picking up on that, saying... Let's try and see what we can do in terms of the online harms bill. How do we toughen it up? Putting forward actual suggestions of trying to improve uh, the bill to the Prime Minister and really kind of getting on the front foot, but not in an, an, an aggressive way or an, an adversarial or a polarised way, but trying to build cross-party consensus. I have to say, I don't think Boris Johnson was necessarily that comfortable with that and he, he did try a bit of knockabout as he tried to criticise Labour for not supporting uh, the policing bill. Now he said that was you're trying to be opposed to stronger sentences for terrorists. Of course it's a massive bill with lots of pieces of legislation in it, some of which Labour are opposed to and, and, and Keir Starmer said I'm not engaging in that knockabout. It somewhat took the wind out of the PM sales but is it going to stick? Is that how we're going to see PM Well we shall see Beth, thank Thank you very much indeed. One thing they didn't talk about was COVID, but we are going to have a news conference on that subject from the Health Secretary at five this evening. Stay with Sky News.